Hello, and welcome to Season 2 of the Medicine and Machine Learning Podcast. I'm your host, David Wu, and in today's episode, I interview Neil Kosla, CEO and founder of Curai, a digital health startup that is using AI and telemedicine to improve the primary care experience. Neil started this company in 2017 after some personal experiences with the healthcare system, and I think it's quite a beautiful story. A common concern of technological advances, especially in medicine, is that they unfairly benefit the wealthy and privileged first. What I like about Curai, and what you'll find out in this episode, is that this company's main focus is on primary care, and that many of their users come from demographics which are traditionally less served by medicine, namely, young women of lower SES. I hope you'll enjoy learning about Neil and his journey with Curai in this episode. And if you haven't already, please follow us on Twitter at The Mammal Podcast. Can you tell us about your path? and how you came to the intersection of medicine and machine learning? Um, well, uh, by background, I'm a machine learning researcher and probably since I was y- as young as I can remember, like I've, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always been good. interested in, um, I've always been interested in quantitative sciences. And so when I got to Stanford in 2011, um, I already knew I wanted to study computer science. I had spent a lot of time growing up and in high school, both coding and then studying theoretical computer science. And so um, I was exposed in my freshman year to uh, this thing called machine learning. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. And you know, over the next few years, I tried to take as many classes as I could. I, I, I uh, did a bit of research as well um, on an autonomous vehicles project. And, um, you know, I was through and through a machine learning research. I even spent some time working in research at Google on some of their machine learning projects. And um, really through that experience that I kind of learned, I didn't want to be a researcher full time, but that I loved the technology and I loved where I thought machine learning could take us. Um, What I kind of figured out was I wanted to work on more direct human problems. And somebody who was a mentor to me at that time kind of said, you should look at medicine. And so my response was to say, hell no. (laughs) Medicine is boring. It's slow. It's regulated. I don't know the first thing about it. Why would I ever work in medicine? And around that time, uh, it was really in a couple of year period where everybody in my life happened to get sick. Um, Everyone from my best friend had a spinal fusion surgery. My other best friend was dealing with an autoimmune condition. Um, My girlfriend got diagnosed as autoimmune. My sister uh, had been dealing with an autoimmune condition. And then it kind of all came to a T when eventually, although this was slightly after we started Kirai, my mom um, mom spent a month in the cardiac ICU at Mayo Clinic. And so I was basically living inside the hospital for a month. And I think Sorry, one of the things that, that I, well, you know, it's what it is. I yeah. Increasingly, I feel glad, I'm glad, I'm lucky she's alive today and modern medicine saved her life, I mean, frankly. And I think one of the things that I was reflecting on was just all of the members of my family were lucky enough to have consistent, personalized guidance and somebody who knew them and stuck with them and could really uh, be there whenever they had an issue. So, you know, I remember early on, um, right after my mom got out of the hospital, it was a Friday night at 9 9 p.m. and she wasn't feeling well. And so she texted her uh, physician and he said, why don't you take a reading with your live core EKG and send it to me, and then we'll figure out what to do. And so she took the reading. This is all via text at 9, 10 at night. She sends it to him. He gets back to her and says, I looked at your EKG. This is atrial flutter. Increase your dosage of beta blockers. And if you don't get worse over the next, you know, if you don't get better over the next two hours, then go to the ED. But otherwise, like, you're fine to stay home. And 
like she never went to the ed she was totally fine wow. but it was the kind of That's moment huge. where yeah. where i was sitting there going gosh like that is the promise of digital health that is the promise of the whole thing it's like had she gone to the ed she was a week out from being hospitalized for a month you know i just i know they would have kept her overnight minimum they would have run a battery of tests she would have felt way worse um and so in terms of the emotional and financial value yeah, saved, yeah. it was massive. And so we just started thinking about like, how do you build a world where everybody has access to clinical guidance in the way that my mom did? Because the, the tools are there, but we're not, you know, like it certainly doesn't exist for most people today. Um, and so when we started Cure I, you know, in 2017, telemedicine was really just starting to get hot we didn't even know we were going to be a telemedicine company our, our whole premise was just we want to build every person in the world eventually uh, a you know a, an ai enabled physician that is always on it's personalized to you and it's available in your pocket and we started as a question, like, could you even do that? And how, how would you do that? And what we discovered over the first call it year plus of the company was the way to do this is to build a full scale clinic um, in which uh, we call it a service, but really we run a virtual primary care service. And as we practice the care, the software is set up to learn from what the physicians do. So when they send certain kinds of messages, when they chart certain things in the notes, when they prescribe medications, when they um, you know, monitor or titrate medication in response to a, a chronic disease change, those are all actions that we want to log and structure in ways that allows us to train machine learning models to either augment or automate parts of their workflow. And that's the premise and the goal is over time, you know, we started with this idea that like the fair market value of a doctor's visit is $150. And if you put it on a video call, maybe it's 50 or 75. Ultimately, we think that, you know, a doctor's visit or what we think of as a doctor's visit should cost a dollar. And if you can do that, you can distribute it basically for free to everyone. And so this idea of having access to healthcare at the front door starts going away because you have this ubiquitous form of, of medicine that can be delivered to everybody. And, you know, that's, that's the goal. And so, yeah. uh, what did I miss there? No, I, I, that's really it. That's fascinating. Like, cause I feel like right now, you know, the current state of healthcare is it's very discreet. You kind of come in discreet visits. You have discreet stays of like, you know, maybe it's one office visit or you stay like a night in the hospital, but, and then, you know, like one visit is like $150, but I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, to get down to this, this $1 mark, which would be awesome. Do you kind of foresee a more like continuous model of healthcare where you're kind of like talking well, abs continuously? Absolutely. I mean, we see this on the platform, right? So some of it is just the care delivery vehicle as well. So we actually, it's not, peer reviewed or anything, but we published a blog post um, about uh, one of our, uh, some of our patient visits. And one of the posts was about a, a patient who was dealing with a, a thyroid issue. Um, and so, uh, let's see. So this patient came in and I think basically over 28 days, um, they were able to, uh, take the patient's TSH from 14 down to 6.6. .6. And the idea is that you can have a long ongoing conversation with many touch points versus, hey, I came in, I had one visit and that was the end of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so for things like chronic diseases, the ability to have many, many light touch points is a significantly better way to manage and monitor than yeah. you know, I see once every six months or 12 months. And I might have slightly more time for that visit or, you know, what have you. Anyways, you get the point. Yeah. I'm curious about how do you bill for something like that? You know, like a month's worth of care where 
you know, like there's many touch points. Is it kind of like each touch point, like a, a quote visit, or is it kind of like throughout the whole month? I, well, I don't know. Like, is it like, yeah, yeah. What do you think? You know, this is just frankly where um, traditional fee schedules and billing codes really break down. Yeah. It, it doesn't, um, it, it certainly doesn't fit. And that's part of why, you know, we, we don't operate as a fee for service clinic today. Um, and this is also why the slow and painstakingly slow shift to value-based care it, it will do a lot of good things for, uh, for American healthcare. Mm. But, um, you know, in the meantime, we've mostly avoided being fee-for-service. And, you know, there are some creative ways you can think about billing for things. So you can think about rolling up the amount of time spent on a patient over some period of time. So it could be a week, a couple of weeks, a month and saying, Hey, this amount of time corresponded with this issue and therefore, but a lot of that is more custom fee schedule stuff that has to be negotiated. I do know some payers who are starting to support things like that. Um, ultimately, you know, we're just not there yet. Mm. I will say that I actually signed up for Cure Eye, uh, yesterday. I, I was very curious. And I signed up and I think it's pretty cool. I, I, I like how you can pick a doctor, you know, and I, and I picked like a, a sleep specialist because I'm like interested in improving my sleep. And, and I thought I, I'm still waiting to hear back. Cause you know, like, I think uh, like it's like one business day or something. And I messaged her on like Friday night, <laughs> but yeah. um, I, I thought it, it's, it's very cool so far. And I'm like looking forward to just seeing how things go. So we have two modes of utilizing the platform. The first and the primary one that we, we think is, is really innovative and interesting is that we can allow patients to pick and match and, and maintain a relationship with an actual primary care physician on the platform. And really, we think there's a lot of value to continuity in care. And we think there's a lot of value in being able to build a relationship. You know, one of my core beliefs is like, for the most part, patients aren't really motivated by a lot of intrinsic health things, but they can be motivated by their relationships with it and another mm. human being. And so mm -hmm. the human to human aspect, the part of that is really, really important. Um, and then we also allow patients if they have an urgent need. So obviously, you know, if you and I have the same physician and we want them at the same time, uh, it's, it's not always feasible. And so we, uh, we promise kind of 24 to 48 hour turnaround times for when you're messaging with your doctor. But if you want it, if you're having an urgent issue right now, you can get any of our on-call doctors at any time. So you go on the app right now. And if you are having symptoms or an issue, you could have access to, you know, lightning fast. Mm. You can think of it as virtual urgent care. What would you say are the most common types of patients you guys see right now? Um, well, we see the whole spectrum in terms of age, in terms of demographic, but um, we historically have skewed female and we skewed young. Um, and so we also skew low end, uh, like low socioeconomic status. So I think by nature of being a uh, more cost afford, you know, more cost effective and affordable solution for seeing a physician we select for people who don't have great options today and i think much of the traditional medical system has not always been great to uh to women and it's not yeah. always been great to people who are lower socioeconomic status and so that's where we found we resonate kind of most uh I think most that's beautiful. highly i think that's beautiful because usually tech i feel like it inequitably benefits people who are of higher SES, you know, but it seems like in this case, the people who are benefiting the most are, you know, demographics that medicine traditionally does not serve very well. And they're usually kind of the last to receive the benefits of new technologies. So th that's actually really cool that you guys are serving this demographic. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's definitely fulfilling. Uh, it's definitely fulfilling. <laughs> Did you expect that when you started out in the beginning? That's a good question.
I would say no. Um, well, I, I didn't. I didn't think we would necessarily be a tool for high-end populations. Um, it was very clear that we weren't. You know, there are services out there like Forward or One Medical that more clearly cater to people on the high end, um, and so we weren't trying to do that. But yeah, I, I you know, I I would say. We, we, I think the extent to which we would resonate with lower income populations, it just didn't, that I didn't recognize the extent to which that would be true. Mm, that's awesome. I'm, I'm curious more about the story behind how the company started. You know, I, earlier we we're talking and you kind of mentioned your freshman, year roommate, how he was employee number one. I was wondering if you could tell us the story of like how Curi began. Oof. Um, well, you're asking me to go back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a lot of it, you know, I had been, I'd started poking around and, and thinking about healthcare, you know, in general, I was, it was remarkable to me as I started seeing, living and learning the healthcare system, uh, either through personal experience or through just spending time in research and doing research and learning from folks who worked in it, how little the con- computing had had benefited the practice of medicine and healthcare in general you know we're 60 years plus into the computing revolution and i would argue for the most part technology has and, and computing and data has if anything only made physicians lives worse and the practice <laughs> of medicine worse and so that that to me was pretty stunning and it was also stunning, frankly, to see some of the things that we just didn't have the tooling and abilities to push into how we practice care, right? Like um, with the amount of information that's published every day, I think it's 70 plus journal articles published every day. You know, there's no way any human being can stay on top of oh, all yeah. of that. And just in terms of being able to make data-driven decisions, even I mean, some of this is like, can we pull up relevant RCTs, which are obviously the gold standard, but mm. in lieu of that, I'd love to have observational data of like what's, what's happening to patients. And, um, you know, I was, I was taken aback by like, you know, the average medical practice doesn't have the ability to pull something as simple as take a health system, take Stanford where you are, right? Um, if, uh Wait, are you at Stanford? I'm at the University of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. you're at University of Minnesota. Yeah. Okay, take the University of Minnesota. Uh, if you, so take University of Minnesota, does the average clinician there have the ability to say, when I'm treating a patient with a given option, can I look at the 1 million patients that we've had in the past who look like them and which percentage of them got treatment mm. A, which percentage of them got mm. treatment B, and of the ones that got treatment A, like what happened to those patients yeah. and the ones that got, there's, there's just no notion of this, right? Yeah. And like, to me, that seems like the basics. That seems like, like we should be doing that no brainer. You kind of would have imagined that it happened years ago. Mm-hmm. And so when I started learning that, about that, you know, my, my belief kind of was like, there's an opportunity to build a new way of delivering care with data and computing at the center. And it's hard because clinicians are really skeptical and frankly of technology, but, and frankly, I think there's a challenge that uh, more broadly uh, it's really, really hard to change medicine. It just is. Yeah. Oh, if yeah. you think about what modern medicine is, it was basically a set of protocols and guidelines for getting rid, rid of new wacky ideas. I mean, that's literally what it was like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? years ago? Like the whole reason modern medicine exists is because the way patients were treated a hundred mm, plus years ago yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. we're going to put, we're going to put leeches on you, even though we have no proof or idea that this works. I mean, it's the like yeah. classic snake, snake oil salesman. And the establishment of modern medicine was really invented in response to that. And they're like, mm-hmm. well, we got all these doctors, so-called doctors doing crazy things to patients. And so what we're going to do is we're going to standardize and we're going to credential people and we're going to make sure they're trained only in the well-known best practices and that their mentality should be that unless there's proof that this thing works, that's really rigorous, it doesn't work. 
Mm. And, and that's really in a couple of sentences, what, what modern medicine and the training behind it is. Yeah. Um, was it, is it the Flexner report or the, I forgot there's like a 1914 or 1911, like report that kind of like is exactly what you're saying. We like learned this first year medical. I've already forgotten, unfortunately, but yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, but you know, think a hundred years later and, I think what we see is like, maybe there are ways in which that mindset needs to evolve and shift Mm -hmm. um, to adapt and, and, you know, to the rapidly changing world around us. And I think, you know, what we see certainly is that new developing a new kind of care delivery is really hard. Um, You know, I always say, well, (laughs) I always say the challenge ultimately is that like, you you can't really do something responsibly until it's standard of care but it's really really hard to make something standard of care Um, and it can't become standard of care unless you're doing it so you've kind of got a chicken and egg problem Mm -hmm. yeah it reminds me of like laparoscopic procedures you know like nowadays that's like pretty standard of care for surgeries it's minimally invasive but when it first came out people were like this is crazy this is barbaric and i feel like you know there's definitely this like luddite sect of medicine where they're you know even with like the stethoscope when the stethoscope came first came out i think in the 19th century people were saying like oh this is increasing the distance between the doctor and the patient because instead of listening to their back you know you have it was actually like a tube it's like oh you're listening via tube to a patient's um back and this is like ruining medicine or this is uh denigrating it no 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 and i feel like that's for in medicine, there is this kind of knee jerk aversion to technological change, because they say that, you know, this is not violating, but somehow like, desanctifying the physician patient relationship. And, and I see this with, uh, yeah, with like new technologies, even just like ultrasound, you know, and especially with digital medicine, uh, people are like, Oh, you know, like, how what you over a computer screen over zoom, how, how much can you really do? But I think the answer is a lot. And I don't know. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my general response to this is like most of what I see of that kind, I mean, it's Mm well-intentioned and I think, you know, there are some good arguments to maintaining at least some of the human parts of care delivery. And that's very important. The, um, the thing that I, I, I think is part of it is just, you have to remember people are taught to be skeptical of new things. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's generally the way that we train our, our medical students. So, um, and people are so afraid of litigate or they're so afraid of being sued, you know, of lit- litigation yeah. and yeah. 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 The malpractice threat is real. I, you know, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic with this new generation of, of, medical students and and doctors to having most of them having grown up in like a technology native kind of way um Mm. are are really on the leading edge of of adopting new tools and taking new mindsets but you know it's uh this is one of the major challenges i I think it is a major challenge and so you have to find responsible ways to test out innovation and sort of grow and Mm. expand and as you get better evidence that it's working yeah, that's kind of the, the mission of this podcast, you know, is just to like spread that awareness to, to nurture that enthusiasm for what I think is the future of medicine too. Yeah, totally. Um, so where were we in this discussion? Oh, yeah. So but how did Cure I begin? You know, like. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about a lot of these things. And around that time, I met my co-founder and CTO, Xavier. Um, he was at Quora at the time. And we started chatting. I mean, it started with some dinners and lunches and, and just chatting about like, hey, you know, is this the kind of problem that we'd want to work on? And I think maybe after about three or four months, he sort of decided like, yeah, let's do this. And then we, we started trying to get our first few folks, um, which included um, a couple of folks who uh, are still with us and wow. have been awesome. Uh, the first two were, well, the first two who are still with us, um, one is a 
very first was a guy named Vignesh Venkatram and, and mm-hmm. he goes by Viggy. Viggy, yeah. uh, he now leads our platform and infrastructure team on the software side. Mm. Incredibly smart and kind human being. Um, and then the two For the others listeners, are, I, I've, uh, played, I've played summer f- football with Viggy and he was an excellent quarterback as well. <laughs> he's... He, he, he's going to be so much more happy about being called an excellent quarterback on a podcast <laughs> than he will about being called one of the smartest and kindest human beings. I know. Um, you can but, tell us uh, I said that great arm. He, he will, uh, he will be thrilled. Um, and then the two others who are still with us, one is uh, Anita Kanan and she, uh, she runs our machine learning research team today. She is also incredibly smart and kind. Um, and then the third who was with us in the early days is a, a guy named Jeff So, and Jeff was a first physician at Kirai, and it was kind of funny. I tell Jeff this all the time when we, you know, we were just a few engineers uh, before that, and we got introduced to Jeff, and the internal discussion was literally, well, we don't know exactly what, because we were, we didn't know we were going to be a telemedicine business at that point or anything like that. Uh, we were like, we don't know exactly what we would do with a physician, but we're pretty sure they would be incredibly valuable. And what we found on day one was Jeff was incredibly valuable. Um, and so those were, you know, it was kind of like just kind of a scrappy set of folks figuring it out in the, in the early days. And running a few experiments and um, trying to figure out where we thought the limits of current technology were and how we could improve on it. There was scraping of the web for different data sets and uh, working on data deals with some research institutions. And so it was very kind of hacky and uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, And uh, you know, at a certain point, we we kind of made the discovery that like this model of being able to generate your own data set was probably the most compelling and interesting way to solve a lot of the really hard technical problems. I mean, when we talk, like most people think that we must be developing some Mondo, like master AI. And Mondo. <laughs> there's like, there's aspects of that where there are things we've built that um, that are, you know, broad that are broad and apply to almost everything that we do. But most of the machine learning and AI we develop is around particular problems that are more mm-hmm. narrow and well scoped and that are built on that yeah. data backbone. And so um, there's, well, anyways, that makes sense. I, I don't yeah. know where I was going with that. <laughs> no, that was, that was great. You started like, so most of the AI is kind of in these like discrete kind of well-formed problems you know, and then like, right. Yeah. Uh, I would generally say that's true. Um, you know, a lot of them are, can also be backed by, we do have a kind of master diagnostic engine. Um, it's really a set of engines that can power, you know, diagnosis and diagnostic reasoning is kind of the backbone of, Mm -hmm. of medicine. And so those models can help inform other things we do certainly, but, other models can be more focused on particular natural language processing uh, problems, or um, we've got models related to treatment recommendations, et cetera. Yeah. As a almost fourth year med student, I'll tell you that it does, a lot of it is algorithmic. You know, Uh, I do think that a lot of it is kind of, there's that human aspect, but I'd say much of it is like, I, I could see, I feel like medicine actually does, synergize very well with you know uh, kind of ml and what the ml promises well so i think um you know the there's a lot of low-hanging places that are most more algorithmic at some level i think the thing that most clinical folks would be surprised is the depth at which machine learning algorithms can start to show real judgment um, mm. and nuanced judgment and reasoning across uh, across pretty difficult problems. And that's, you know, I think over the last about five years, we've really seen that um, with sufficient data and properly directed data, um, 
you can start to build models that go beyond the, hey, this is a formulaic or protocolized kind of form of medicine. Mm -hmm. They can actually start to reason and think a little bit. Um, wow. And I suspect the next 10 years will be filled with that, that we will go yeah. from, I mean, look, so like this isn't a cure example. This is another alive core example, which I already mentioned, but um, you know, they can take an EKG and they've got an FDA breakthrough clearance to uh, measure somebody's blood potassium levels. What? Wait, How does that so make what, any what, sense? Wait, say that. So with the EKG, say, okay, say it one more time. They can measure a, uh, they can take an EKG and use that to predict your blood potassium levels. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Wow. So, wow. Wow. That's the kind of thing That's where you're impressive. like, it's a, you know, it's a smartphone EKG and they can literally tell this thing that you're like, how could you possibly have any signal to that? You're not yeah. getting any blood from me. Um, and so there's a lot of signal in yeah. things that look like noise to human beings. And there's these algorithms that get really, really good, not just at, at separating that signal, but then taking complex reasoning problems and starting to, to replicate them. And that's really the basis of our model is that with sufficient and, and well-structured data, uh, you should be able to take on a lot of what we think of as hard reasoning judgment problems in medicine. Yeah. And I feel like, I think one day we'll probably get to the point where it will be able to reason better than us. And what I mean by that is, so back to the potassium EKG thing. Um, you know, what, many of our listeners are med students. And I think I'm sure a lot of them will remember that with like hyperkalemia, you get peak T waves, you know, where like you, you get U waves and the EKG with hypokalemia. And, and I think, you know, it's like as potassium levels increase, you see more of that. Um, and so like, maybe that's kind of how they reasoned it out. But of course, like, no, I don't think any physician could tell you like a value, like, oh, the potassium is six based off of an EKG. Like no one could do that. Um, yes. And, and then another example is like, you know, ML is really good at predict or with retinal scans, it can predict your gender, which is insane. Like, I think the accuracy rate is like 95, 97%, but that's like no ophthalmologist could ever predict a person's gender from just a retinal scan. And I'm thinking of maybe one day we'll get to the point where it can see things better than we can and kind of alert us to things before, you know, we perceive it. Yeah. I mean, and I think, um, certainly that that will be true uh it, it, if it's not true it won't be a technology issue it will be a people and regulatory systems uh, issue. <laughs> uh -huh. um you know in so far i, I want to ask true, about that later later on i want to ask about regulation okay. we'll continue continue um you know i i i would just also say that like look we're moving into a world where we are going to have tremendous amounts of data on individuals, right? And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about just your wearables or your Apple Watch or whatever you got. Like increasingly we're moving to a world, this is the whole movement to, uh, of precision medicine where you're gonna have multi-omic data about a patient longitudinally. And if you really want to practice, I mean, look, <laughs> genetics are the best example of this. Mm -hmm. we sequenced the genome more than 20 years ago what outside of BRCA1 BRCA2 has the average American received a recommendation if they've received that they're mm -hmm. lucky by the way has the average American received a, a recommendation related to their genetics sure some of that has to do with the cost of genetic sequencing but you know like for 99 bucks at this point I can go on 23andMe and, and get my you know, DNA sequence. So it's, it's really more of a regulatory challenge. And then, you know, part of this goes back to what I was saying, which is like the adoption rate inside clinical communities really lags with this stuff. So oh, yeah. we may have 25 years or 20 years where because, and this is because we are slow to adopt new technology and understanding of new things that we're measuring, it's really only wealthy, affluent, scientifically minded people who benefit from new information and new guidance. I mean, there's all the work going on in the aging world as well. And, you know, when I think about things that are deeply unethical, it's that certain people have access to things that can help them expand their life. 
like literally life and death, <laughs> your lifespan will be a factor. And of course, there's so many other determinants, but it will be determined and, and reduced by the fact that there are that the, the clinical minds that you have access to are not willing to adopt mm. new technologies and new sets of information. And that is deeply, deeply unethical. Yeah. It is it is deeply un, uneven and it's deeply unethical. And so that's something that I, I think about all the time. And part of what we're trying to do with Cura is to say, hey, we can provide decision support tools and other kinds of reasoning tools that stay on top of that information mm -hmm. and help clinicians and patients have that be more available to them so that there isn't that. 17 year lag, I think is what the, at least I've seen some reviews that point to that. And, and ultimately you can imagine a world where computer's job is to stay on top of all of these things for a clinician mm -hmm. and, and highlight the relevant things. Um, and we, you know, probably the best example of exactly that is how the average physician uses up today, today. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Like this is the one of the dirty secrets of medicine. Like oh, you don't yeah, know what to do. Sure. You just you just for go sure. on up to date and you read whatever is reviewed. Sure. But up to date, of course, it's done <laughs> manually and it's a pretty large scale effort to mm -hmm. try and um try and stay on top of that information. Yeah. And it's hard. We think that in an eventual world, not only will you have computers that can pull all of that information continuously, but then highlight it, highlight the relevant stuff at the relevant time in your care delivery vehicle, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I have to go up and look this up separately. Yeah. Um, and I think for our non-medical listeners, I should tell them what up to date is. It's just okay. pretty much, it's the, the Wikipedia of medicine where um, probably at least one of your docs has looked up on up to date at some point in your care where it's like, if you come with a condition and they for, kind of forget about it, or they're like, want to look up recommendations, they'll go on up to date. Uh, and it's like subscription based and it's super expensive, but it pretty much tells you, it kind of, it literally tells you it usually in algorithms, like what to do. Like if patient has this, then do this. If patient's yeah. pressure is this, then do this. These are the meds. These are the doses. It's, it's like, I feel bad kind of spilling the dirty secret, but yeah, like that you're, you're right. It, it's, it is what well, we it's do. Yeah. It's, it's only a dirty secret. And this is the, the challenge because like, it's impossible to hold all that information yeah, in your yeah. head, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much scientific knowledge we have today. So the ability to pull that up at the relevant time and serve it to the physician at the relevant time and to merge that with a, any additional data or either observational or RCT that we have um, on the patient, like that's where, when I talk about computing native health, like healthcare delivery, that's what it's got to look like. Right. Um, there shouldn't be a notion of like, Hey, I talked to the patient and then I went and looked it up. Like it should all be seamless and it should all happen ultra fast and mm. be as data driven as possible. Um, cause we have so much data about what's going on with patients in the world. We just don't use it to, mm. in our medical practice, which is insane. Would you say that is your vision for QRI? Um, or something else? I mean, I'd say that that's certainly a big part of it. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that's the whole, the, the whole, uh, the whole of it. I'd say, but building tell the, us the whole the, of your vision for QRI. Well, you know, I'd say the other thing that that misses is just that, that accessibility part of it, right? Mm, like ultimately mm, look mm. at it this way. We just don't have enough physicians to deliver care to 8 billion people. We don't have enough physicians to deliver care here in the US and to obviously US, 300 million, yeah. <laughs> right? And and obviously there are inflationary incentive uh, design issues in how US healthcare is delivered, but it's just far too expensive. And so, you know, one part of it is how do you make it more data driven? How do you make more computing native care delivery? And then the other part of it is one of the benefits of embedding those things into software is that you can make it available to everyone. And so the thing I say to most physicians is like, hey, today you sit down and you might treat eight, 15. If you're crazy, you might treat 30 or 40 patients in a day. I want to give you tools that let you treat 3000 in a day. And you should operate like an air traffic controller where, you know, you have insights and visibility into how patients are interacting with the software um, and some oversight of either other support staff or 
um, or the software itself to be able to interact with the patient. And then when you see something important, you go drill down into it and stop and you radio in and you say, what's going on here? And, uh, you know, that kind of world is the world that we can get to, but it's going to require, you know, new innovation and, and change. And it's, it's not going to look like the, I sit down with all my patients for 15 minutes at a time or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I don't think anyone's happy one. with that system, you know? No, you know, they're not, but uh, it, it's the default and it's mm. the standard of care today. So moving away from it is very, very difficult. When do you think a patient should go into the clinic to see the doc or would that be possible with Curie? Um, well, so today we're all virtual. We do have some, we do manual referral processes, right? So like if you need, um, if you need specialist care, we have two options. We have a virtual specialty network that's a partner that will do physician to physician consults. So our PCPs can get a consult mm -hmm, from a physician. Mm -hmm. And then the other option is um, we will also just refer patients into brick and mortar clinics um, when they need it. It's, you know, it's, it's not totally ideal, admittedly. Um, I, I think what we'll see is an increasing amount of things that can be done virtually. I mean, you know, people think traditionally that, it's really only the low acuity stuff. I brought up the example with my mom and the ECG. It, there's so much that can be done to push more into the virtual environment by utilizing, I mean, there's people working on portable ultrasounds that are, uh, that can be uh, administered, self-administered. Oh, wow. People who are, yeah, like there's, there's some crazy, crazy stuff out there, right? Yeah. Um, and so you think about the ability to get diagnostic signal off of a patient, I think in the next I mean, it's already, it's today, it's already an integration problem. It's not, it's, it's not a problem of, do we have these things? Mm, it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's distributing them and then getting them integrated into your medical system, you know, to your software systems. Um, you know, Epic is not set up to deal with a portable EKG or a portable uh, yeah. you know, ultrasound or what have you. Um, and I think in the next five years, it'll only become even greater. And, you know, obviously there was companies like Theranos who were fraudulent, but I guarantee you there will be another company working on, on, on similar things. I know of a few already who are they're they're in the early days, but you know, that vision and that promise hasn't gone away. And so we're moving to a world where increasingly we will be able to pull data off the patient. Now there are still some things that ultimately require going in person. Um, and many of those things are procedural and we don't focus on or think about today inpatient care as much as we do outpatient care, at least in the context of Curie. But I think if you look far enough out, a lot of those things will change. At some point, we will give, be giving patient fully robotic surgeries and stitches and all yeah, of those things. Yeah. There's, there's just no doubt in my mind. The question is just when and how fast. Um, mm. And you know, some of those things, invasive surgeries, for example, will take longer as they should. Um, others won't, uh, but uh, it'll sort of be step by step. And so I, I, I think we're increasingly moving towards a world where healthcare is everywhere and it's mm -hmm, delivered mm -hmm. and practiced everywhere. It's continuous, huh? And yeah. And the clinic is, is, probably a relic of that system. I mean, there are companies who are working on a house calls and things like that, but I, I suspect that, you know, over time, the healthcare real estate will be less valuable, although it will still maintain some value, um, you know, for a small percentage of high value things. And then, you know, in inpatient hospital care, that's a whole different beast. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. You know, there's a lot of interesting tech work that could be done to automate and to uh, modernize, but I, I, I don't know. It's a different beast. It, we'll, it seems we'll avoid to me into that, one. that Curi, one of Curi's strengths is that it's really good at primary care and making that accessible. Yeah. I mean, that's where we focus. Mm -hmm. So was know, that kind of like the original intention to just focus on primary care? Yeah. I mean, that's where most patients start their journey, right? So yeah. That's why we wanted to be there. Mm. How has regulation affected you guys? Oh, how has regulation affected us? Um, 
you know, we operate today mostly in a decision support world. So we're, you know, we're not at a point where we're pushing AI driven medical decisions. And I think we want to be appropriate, re appropriately responsible in how we would eventually do that. Um, the FDA has been really progressive and I think uh, thoughtful about how they're allowing, you know, I mentioned the whole thing with a live core, a live core has a, I think a couple of breakthrough clearances now wow. where they're able to actually do a diagnostic process with, with AI um, and they're doing it in cardiac care. And there's a couple of other companies that have done this as well. There's, there's a list, but I forget which ones there are. Um, and then you've got like, uh, I think it's Viz AI that has a, they have a CPT code for their yeah. AI, which is pretty nuts. Um, Crazy. So yeah. the, the FDA has been really good and they've been very clear to say that as long as you keep things in the control of the physician, you can be classified as decision support. Um, you know, and then we'll like everybody else have to go through that regular, the regulatory cycle of, um, that is not legal advice, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I'm obliged to say. To make that but, clear uh, for our listeners. We will we'll go through a regulatory cycle of, of trying to you know, work with them to get certain things approved. We're not there yet, but uh, so uh, this is a long way of saying, at least on the diagnostic and ML side, the, regu the regulatory structures have been good to us for the whole, on the whole, you know, we haven't gone through the long pa painstaking process of getting approval. Um, but I, I actually think the places that re regulation have probably affected our business more are in practice of medicine and things like, can you deliver chat first telemedicine and mm. how mm -hmm. do you do that? How has mentorship shaped your path? How has mentorship shaped my path? You know, my biggest mentor is probably my father. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to be born with a built-in mentor in that regard. Uh, somebody who's been involved, I don't talk about it a lot, but somebody who's who's been involved in the tech world and, and um, it's just general, you know, he knows how to build companies from scratch and uh, it's hard to work with your, uh, with your parents, but the, the greatest part of it is that there's a sense of unconditional, like mm. uh, unconditional love, you know, that they're supporting you. And so when you have issues, it's not, it's not because you don't care about each other yeah to work towards the the right things but he's been an invaluable resource in helping me figure out how to navigate some of the choices we've had um and uh i i certainly wouldn't be where i am today i mean it was a total hack and cheat and um so i certainly wouldn't be where i am and I, i'd say outside of that i mean I've, I've been able to benefit a lot. Look, I stepped into a CEO role having never run anything larger than like a six person class project. So, uh, I, Gotta start I, was, so woefully, right? <laughs> I was so woefully un unprepared, um, for the job that I was doing and I benefited a lot. I mean, Xavier, our CTO in the early days, especially, but even today, so many times has to teach me things that you would assume are basic for people who uh, manage organizations to know. Um, and the only thing that's changed is I sort of know what I don't know, or I know mm. that there are things that I don't know. Whereas when we started, I didn't know, I didn't even have a conception that there was things that I didn't know. Um, Can you give an example I, of something that you learned? Um, probably the biggest and most and clearest example is how important it is to to repeat and try and clarify what your goals are. Uh, um, mm, I like that, man. I like that a lot. Uh, that, that was one that was very counterintuitive to me. Uh, I, like I sort of assumed lot. like, I know what we're trying to accomplish. If I say it once, everyone will get it. Uh, it's very far from the truth. Um, and it's not, it's just, it, it's the nature of, of work and working across, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh one of, the, one of the things I've learned, if you sit in a room with 20 people and you say one thing, there are 20 different messages uh, that were received. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of learnings like that along the way. Um, and 
And so I've leaned a lot on the other members of my executive team. Chavi has been with us, me the longest as my co-founder, but now I have a set of a, a team of six and that leadership team is exceptional to work with. And I learn a lot from all of them. I've got a, an executive coach who's, who's been a great mentor to me mm. and has helped me figure out, I mean, all, all sorts of things, everything from how do you run a, you know, how do you run a performance review? Should you run a performance mm, review process wow. to, uh, how do you, how do you let someone go to, yeah. uh, so there's, there's all these types of things that, you know, you sort of assume are table stakes, but then are hard to do in practice. That's yeah. Um, and I feel like it's stuff, you know, that's, that's cool that I feel like we just don't hear about that side of running it. Cause I, you know, like, I feel like it's usually very romanticized in the public mind, but there's just a lot of things that just the average person doesn't know. And of course, how would you know, you know, it's like most people don't run companies. <laughs> you know, the, the number one thing I'd say to people is like, the other thing I've learned a lot about from a, 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 just a self-learning perspective and a uh, psychological perspective is there's very much in a, a moment where you realize the emperor has no clothes. Like mm. if you work at a company or in any setting, as long as there's somebody above you who you feel like has things under control and you trust them, you can go to bed at night and be like, mm. yeah, they, they've kind of got this under control. And there's all so many moments as a startup founder where you, you just realize like, oh shit, I'm, I'm the one who's supposed to have this under control. And then you go, ah, shit, what do I do? Mm. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a moment there where you, you realize like, oh, every, you know, when I'm the one where the buck stops and I've got to figure out this problem and there's nobody else who has this under control, it, it's a very it's a very different moment psychologically. And I think even when we think about like larger problems on a macro scale, like almost everything in our lives is reduced to being somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, it, it makes it easier to cope with, to feel like somebody else has this under control. Climate change, like, oh, Al Gore is <laughs> working on that, right? Yeah. Like, um, Or my health problems, oh, my doctor will take care of that. Exactly, like I think, and, and that's a good thing. It's good to outsource your problems at times, right? Like, I think you'd be crushed by the weight if you felt like you had to solve every single one of your problems all the time. It's really interesting in a startup to learn to deal. And, it, you know, for me, it's been a journey into mindfulness and some other things mm. Be like, okay, we've got six massive problems right now. The product isn't working. We've got this whatever problem with business development we've got this other mm. problem with a person we've got two employees who don't like each other like whatever it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you realize like no oh, nobody's gonna solve that those problems but me and you can panic when you feel that way or you can learn to be like i've seen this before it's gonna be okay let me systematically take this one by one i can yeah. sleep on it the problem will still be there in the morning like having that patience and, and composure is really meaningful. Mm. That actually takes me to three questions that I want to ask every guest this new season. And they're not really traditional AI, ML medicine questions, but they're okay. actually three questions that I learned from a doctor. And uh, he kind of asks every, he's kind of an unconventional guy. He asks every patient this, but I really like them. And the three questions are one, what are you most afraid of? Two, what do you believe in? And three, what gives you strength? Um, first and foremost, I, I'm very, very afraid that some of the things that we've built will be, will be lost in the sands of history uh, or sands of time. Ozzy Mandias. I don't know if you remember that uh, poem, but yeah. King of Kings. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and it's, and it's not to, to I think overplay what we're doing, but I really, I really do think there have been some, we've built some really incredible tooling and, and some really incredible technologies and softwares and products. And I, I, I feel like there's a reasonable shot at, at changing the way that we think about how medicine is delivered, at least in the primary care setting. 
but there's a lot of work we need to do to not to, to actually make that transformative and let that reach lives. And so a lot of what we're focused on is, is ha- how do you do that so that I'm not sitting here in, in 10 years talking to you when this podcast is, uh, you know, uh, when it's Joe Rogan side <laughs> and everybody's Thanks, listening man. to machine learning and medicine. And, uh, you know, we're like, well, we had the, you know, we had it, we had it, but just, it kind of died and it, you know, mm. went to the graveyard of startups. So that, you know, that's, that's what I'm most afraid of. The second question was, what do I believe in? Yeah. Is that just in life? Just what do you believe in? Yeah. What do you believe in, in life? Um, You know, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, I'm generally a believer that uh, I'm trying to figure out. I'm going to go down a really different train than I think what you. Sure. No, no. Whatever you want. Uh, Yeah. Whatever you want. Probably probably one of my most central like core beliefs in life is uh, that humans are deeply, deeply emotional creatures Mm -hmm. um and that people think that there's a professor named jonathan height who has great work on this but uh people generally believe that they make decisions and uh those decisions are based on some set of thought it's it's very very clear that uh (laughs) that is not the case that we have emotions. Those emotions force us to make decisions and then we rationalize them. And Mm. so I think we've got an inverted uh, way of interpreting how, how decisions are made and how people respond to different things. So take something like our whole discussion about the culture of of medicine and and medical delivery um, and medical training. Uh, Some people will listen to this podcast and say, that is the stupidest and most insane thing ever. And other people will say, oh yeah, totally right. And in both of those cases, that will be entirely informed by a feeling they had when they heard what we were talking about. There's no, they will rationalize it later, but it will be entirely based off of feeling. So that's, that's one thing I believe really core. I'd say the other thing that's, that's very uh, core to who I am is that I believe a lot in childish, childish wonder. So like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um, uh, as my girlfriend will tell you, I, I will stop and marvel at the stupidest things. Um, and, and I love to laugh and find humor in things. So, uh, yeah, I, I generally try and act as close to, you know, I try to act like a very, like a very mature eight-year-old. Mm. And the last question is what gives you strength? Uh, my parents. Mm. Really, really simple answer. Um, I'm, yeah. I have two wonderful parents. Uh, they mean everything to me. And uh, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with them. And they are some of my greatest friends and supporters in the world. So that's where it comes from. I, I wish every single person in the world had the foundation that I have with my parents emotionally and in, mm-hmm. intellectually. Um, my, my mom, who I haven't mentioned besides in the context of her health is like the world's greatest cheerleader. She believes in the people around her just to no end. And, and that's a really good foundation to have. So there's your answer. Great. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, there is one question that I, I would, I would like to finish this this podcast episode with um lex friedman is one of my heroes and he kind of always asks his guests like what they think love is or what do you think love is um this new season i kind of want to start asking everyone what do you want from the universe what do i want from the universe and there's so many ways to interpret that question um I, I think at a, at a spiritual level, um, the thing that I, you know, I, I want from, I'm interpreting that question as like, what do I want out of my experience 
from uh, like inside the universe, my conscious experience in the universe. And I, um, I'm not going to interpret that as like, what do I actually, what, what, what do I wish the physical universe would give to me? Cause in, in that case, I would say like, please not the heat death of the universe. Um, and yeah, 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 exactly. that's all I can ask for. Uh, maybe like it could imbue me with some superpowers to bend the laws of physics from time to time. That, that, that's probably like my first answer, but, but I think spiritually, like, what do I want from my, my time on the universe? I think, uh, connection with other conscious beings uh and uh joy I, I think joy and laughter i think that those three things are basically everything that i i try and maximize for in my time um and and i think joy and and laughter for other people as well so if i can reduce suffering and or bring joy or laughter to other people that's that's a good life spent and so there's your answer Heat, death of the universe, and joy and laughter. It was very inspiring. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Neil. I think it's been a great time talking with you. I don't, there's car alarms going off. Can you hear that? Vaguely. Shit. Okay. Well, damn, this sucks. <laughs> but anyways, I, thankfully, it's kind of by the end of the interview. But um, thank you so much, no Neil. This was a, a great conversation. And um, I really hope the best for you and Kirai. And, uh, yeah, you know, course. a lot of our listeners are med students or in the medical profession. Maybe, you know, Curie will be a part of their future practice. Well, if um, there is anybody for whom what I said resonated, uh, we're always looking to hire talented people. And so that's both in terms of our, uh, yeah, it's across the board. So if you're interested, you know, don't hesitate to reach out um, and uh, we'd love to chat.